Hello to d d players far and wide. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, today is going to be a little bit more of a low-key video. I'm going to try to go through, not really with a script, but just give my thoughts on the d d classes and try to uh, at least give a tier list for uh, new players and what classes they should uh, choose. So this might be a little bit rambly, and it's not going to be as succinct as other videos, but I'm just trying to do something a bit more low-key today. So for the first class, we have the Artificer, and I'm putting it in D tier for new players, and this is why. The Artificer in general is a very complicated class, and it requires an intense understanding of D&D 5e mechanics that you can't really expect a new player to understand. You have to basically have an understanding of uh, spells, attunement slots, um, you know, all of these other magical items that you can potentially create. Then you have all these complicated subclasses. And therefore, the Artificer, I just don't think, is a really good pick for new characters. You know... It's definitely an extremely powerful class, but a new player is just not going to get a lot out of it. And if you're using, for instance, a virtual character sheet like D&D Beyond, I, I don't like the way it's set up for Artificers. I don't think it does a good job of helping players keep track of everything. So for that reason, Artificer is D tier. Next we go to a Barbarian. This is firmly B. I think you can give the Barbarian to any new player, and they'll generally get the hang of it. Uh, barbarians aren't too complicated. Um, the, I think where they might fall, though, is where you place ability scores, and that's what I've seen from new players who choose Barbarian. They attempt to flesh out intelligence, wisdom, and charisma maybe a bit more than they should, and so... Their AC might be a bit lower, they might not be attacking as well, and then you have this problem where if they're not raging and they're not reckless attacking, everything can kind of compound on each other and they just might feel a little bit less powerful than the rest of the party, and we don't want that for new players. So, uh, but an the Barbarian is still, it's still good, I mean... No matter what, as a Barbarian, you're going to just be absorbing damage, which is what you're kind of supposed to do. And you're going to be attacking. You, It's a pretty straightforward fantasy mindset, so I think role-playing comes a bit easier with this class. Um, all the subclasses, I think, are pretty good, except for Berserker. And unfortunately, that's what you see, um, at least in D&D Beyond, uh, when you first get the Barbarian, if you are a new player and you don't see anything else. And Berserker is, like, the worst subclass in the game. Well, no, no, I think Monk Four Elements... Four Elements Monk is probably the worst subclass in the game, but Berserker is, like, right there. And it's just so terrible, and it's such a trap, because a new player will look at it and think, oh, I get an extra attack. Like, this is, this is great. I'm just going to choose this, get an extra attack. Life is good. As we all know, it's not that simple. Exhaustion is crippling, and I've seen so many players take Berserker, and then within two levels they say, I, I don't like this at all. DM, can I please change? I'll say sure, and it, it just kind of sours the experience. But everything else, if you can steer the players away from Berserker, Barbarian's good. It's just a very easy class to get it, your hands on, and I think it's good. So, solid B. Next, we go for the Bard. And the Bard is B as well. Now, for experienced players, I think the Bard is much higher. But for a new player, you have to come to terms with a few things. One, you're not going to be doing a ton of damage with the Bard. Because you are firmly a support character. And you always have to keep that in mind. And new players generally they want to be doing damage or they want to be succeeding in combat and the bard is much more esoteric for how they are helping uh, 
they still do help, but you need to find kind of the right player initially to choose a bard. Then, uh, lack of spells. For a new player, spells are hard enough, but when you have so few and you can't switch them out, uh, that's, that's just rough. Because all your spell choices matter so much more, especially at the early levels where there's a bunch of early spells for uh, a bard that just really are, are kind of traps that you don't necessarily want new players choosing. Um, specifically, I can think of what you got spells like Jump and Long Strider and True Strike and just a whole bunch of others that you really don't want players choosing um, because it's, they're not going to be using them that often. It's just a wasted uh, choice for a spell. And uh, I, I think another kind of weakness of the Bard is the the inspiration mechanic at the early levels where players don't necessarily understand it especially if you're kind of a new player like you you're struggling to kind of learn the combat system and the inspirations go so quickly that again it, it's hard to to kind of put that new system on because the inspiration usage is very kind of situational and you have to know when exactly to use your inspirations. Um, but some good things about the bard. It's charisma based. And a fast talking bard is great for new players. Because it allows them to role play. Uh, it allows them if they're musically inclined. To bring some of their musical talents into the game. And it it's a very straightforward face role. Uh, which is great. It, uh, it's very simple. It allows players to talk and for their talking to succeed, which new players I've found generally really like. And yeah, it's subclasses are all pretty solid. Um, as long as you don't go, let me see. Actually, no, I, th I don't think there's really a bad bard subclass thinking about it. They're all decent. I mean, College of Swords, I think, might be a bit underpowered, but it's not going to be, like, crippling in the way that the uh, Berserker is to the Barbarian. Uh, yeah, but I think Bard is strictly, I think it, it's B. It's solid B. It, this is, if you were recommending a, a talking face roll, you could pretty much give this to any new player, and they do fine. Um, not a lot of pitfalls in the B tier. Like, I consider B tier to be, this is solid. Like, as a DM, you can give this to a player, and they'll they'll be fine. Um, I think I'm getting all my B tiers out of the way early, since I think Cleric is actually probably going to go B tier. I'm going, yeah, I think Cleric's B, because again, this is solid. This is the solid tier where you can give this to a new player, and they'll be solid. Uh, I Easily, Cleric can be A or S, I think. But it, it depends on the player, because you'll give the Cleric to some new players, and it's S right away. Like They will get and they will understand the Cleric. And you give it to some, and they go D because their party relegates them to just being a heal bot and they start hating the game because they're not doing anything. And that's kind of why I'm splitting the difference with cleric because mechanically clerics are super powerful. I bet all of you know this if you've been playing D&D 5e for the last few years now. If when you're a cleric, there are so many amazing subclasses, you get great spells. I mean spirit guardians, um was it spiritual weapon? You get, obviously, your revivifies. You'll eventually get Divine Intervention, which is um, a mini-wish, I like to say. And you just get so much, and you're so great at whatever you're trying to do. A cleric can be a tank. They can be uh, a tank kind of being a forge cleric. They can be a blaster, which is a light domain cleric. They can, of course, be a heal bot, which is um, a life cleric. But even life clerics, they, they can fight. Every, every single cleric can do things 
well. I think in the most recent uh, campaign of Critical Role, you had two clerics. They operated on completely different spectrums. One was more of a damage dealer. The other was a really good healer. I mean, Trickster Domain versus, uh, what is it, Grave Domain? Yeah. Ah, it's, it's hard because I really want to put Cleric in A or S just because I... I've played clerics and they can completely take over a game, take over a party, change the dynamics of battle. But I also know that being a cleric for a new player, there's a lot to understand mechanically and in the roleplay. So I'll go mechanics first, where I'll, you have to choose your spells. You have access to the entire spell list, basically, because you can mix and match after a long rest. And you have to basically go through and learn all these spells learn what they do and if not you're not getting the most out of your cleric which is like s tier for me is you give this to a new player and they're almost instantly getting the most out of their character and are understanding it cleric you it's just not what you're going to get and also healing in dnd fifth edition is weird in combat because you don't want to heal unless your party members at zero really unless they're threatened with lethal damage and it's just a, a one hit kill uh, because they're as effective at one hit point as they are at maximum hit points and so you'll have cleric players dumping you know first level cure wounds into people and then they go down and you, they feel like oh my cure wounds did nothing so yeah your cure wounds did really do nothing because it's not enough healing to really mitigate anything like they would still probably go down like maybe you get them another hit but it would be better to probably just use a cantrip and a healing word or any other combination of spells that you could potentially do and that's kind of where i am with a cleric mechanically where you have a lot of opening pitfalls tactically and players have to really just begin learning everything uh, in terms of combat, understanding action economy, and getting to that higher level. And then roleplay, of course, you have to... You have a deity. You have to navigate around the stigma of a cleric just being a healer. And that's not necessarily something I want to put on a new player. And I think that there are, are better avenues for that new player than a cleric in terms of RP viability. So cleric, solid B. Next I'm going with Druid. Now Druid, I'm just gonna place it here for now, is it's my favorite class, bar none. Um, I love Druid to death. It is everything that I want from a class. And it, in my opinion, Druid is the most powerful class the most powerful when i'm playing a druid i can take over a session unlike any others i can you put me in a combat encounter and i erase the normal challenge rating with a druid because i am manipulating the battlefield to such an extent that yeah you might have powerful enemies but they can't do jack shit now like i am just beating you like by force um like in chess, like there are there are certain positions if you're playing chess where you are just winning by force. Like you can just keep on going, and there's nothing the other side can do, and druids can do that. However, for new players, druids are D. I I would um I don't know actually which is worse, druids or artificers, for new players because here's the thing. Druids are a super complicated class. Super complicated. And it kind of, it has the problem of the cleric where you have access to your entire spell list, but you don't have a ton of damage, at least right away. And a new player might not understand what their role is in a combat. They, they don't know everything about battlefield manipulation. They can't see the different steps in the future that you might need to take. You don't have an understanding of the action economy. Um, wild shapes, I found, are very underutilized for new and, almost, and intermediate players with druids. I 
Druids are complicated. They do a lot. Subclasses are very important. If you go Circle of the Land Druids, then... Uh, it, it, it's tough. And even going Moon Druid, which is, in my opinion, the most powerful subclass in the game, or any of the other Druid subclasses that are just great, you, you might not get the most out of them. Actually, I'll go out and say that 95% of new players will not get anything out of them. Druids will just be, eh. I've had new players, and they've seen me play Druids, and they say, oh, that that's super powerful. And I say, yeah, but I don't know if you should play it. And they'll say, no, no, no. I, I'm going to go, and I'm going to play this Druid. And they do it, and after, like, mm, 10 sessions, they say, I, I am having zero fun. I, I can't do what you did. I don't know what to do. I, I'm trying, but I everything's situational, everything's concentration. I don't know what I'm doing. And I say, yeah, okay, we'll we'll see. Like maybe we get you a new character, maybe you change classes, maybe we get you to a cleric instead, or something else. And that's kinda ends up what's happened with most of my druids, unfortunately. Through no fault of the players, it's just really complicated. Um, and so Druid is going to be, unfortunately, D tier for me. Pretty solidly D. Fighter. Fighter is A. For new players, Fighter is just a terrific option. Uh, I, It's only pitfall is that early on you just have one attack. And if you miss that attack, then you're kind of... Well, that's just a wasted round for you. But once you get higher into your leveling fighter just becomes great for new players you have very few things you need to worry about uh you got your second wind easy to understand you have your action surge you have of course your attack all of the fighter subclasses i like champion is great for new players because you just say ah you crit more you get more critical hits don't you like that and they say yeah and it's just super easy to learn. And if they're a little bit more advanced, I say, okay, well, we have Samurais. We have this new Echo Knight. If they're, like, really trying to un understand d and I'll say, hey, let's try you out with a Battlemaster, maybe. It's just great. Fighters are just really, really good for new players. You can't really go wrong. You can have them basically choose any race if they want to go human fighter let them go human fighter because it just teaches them how to make backstory and how to make character i don't think human fighters are inherently bad um human fighters can be just as interesting and unique as any other race class combination and they're really strong they get that extra feat and that's really useful for fighters fighters love their feats and Fighter, just over time, teaches new players the game. That's that's kind of the long and short of it. It's a great way to just teach the game. Like, the name of the class, Fighter. You know what your role is in combat. You're fighting. You're up in the front or back lane, but you're doing damage. Players love that, so... I don't think I need to say any more. Fighter, yeah, that's a solid A. Uh, next up, we have the Monk. The Monk is C. For a number of reasons. Um, the fantasy of the monk is like a Shaolin warrior. But you don't really get that until the second or third tier of play. I'll say third tier of play. So like level 9 or 10 is when you're really coming into your own as a monk truly. And really starting to get powerful. But before that, you're not powerful. Because you don't have key points. Because the engine of the monk is the key point. And when you get them at second level, I believe, you only get two. And you just kind of slow down with everything. Which is unfortunate. Um, your attacks aren't doing a ton of damage. You can't really use a ton of your monk abilities. You are dependent on so many different ability scores. I mean, you need dexterity, constitution, wisdom... And you would, to fulfill the fantasy of a monk, I would almost say you also want intelligence, because you want to have almost like this sagely feel, I would think. Um, but you're just not getting that. The subclasses of the monk, uh, 
are kind of underwhelming, in my opinion. Uh, there, are, there are some new subclasses that are good, and that are kind of getting away from everything being key point dependent. But it's just a lot of complicated stuff for a monk. And new players just... Uh, it's, it's a lot of new mechanics for them to learn. Because not only do they have to learn basic combat, they have to learn monk combat, which is completely different. Because uh, you have to understand key point usage. You have to understand... Like, you're not a tank. You're not necessarily a frontline fighter. You don't have the hit points to be up and fighting for a long time. And usually you might not have that AC. It's, it's rough being a monk player at the early levels um, until you get that stunning strike at fifth level I believe yeah it's it, it's tough um, and for that reason I th think monk is C I'm pretty pretty sure it's, it's C it's not the worst because a monk is is still going to pretty much be effective you're getting more attacks than anyone else so you don't have the fighter problem of necessarily attacking missing and then you do nothing monks can still do things uh, but for new players I tend to to almost give them like some more key points or just try to help them out with being a monk and make their road a little bit easier so that they can get doing their monk abilities quicker but if I as a DM have to step in and really start tweaking things like yeah you're going into the C tier next up paladin I don't think I need to explain this too much S Paladins, super simple. You can do a little bit of everything. You have great attacking power, uh, bolstered by your Divine Smites. So, new players, they like doing a ton of damage. Hey, I'm going to give you the Paladin. Because the Paladin is going to get its damage done. And there's very little anyone can do to stop it. And if you just run a few encounters every day, Paladins doing their damage, they're happy. They also get their Lay on Hands, so they will be healing. And usually, if you recommend they have a high Charisma stat, um, they'll get some Charisma in there. And they'll be able to talk as well, so they'll be able to do everything pretty well. Now, it's multi-ability score dependent, but honestly, with a new player, Paladin's just so good. Um, at, at pretty much everything, it, it allows the player to really get their... their it, it allows them to do everything in the game, which is, I think, important. Because if they're doing everything in the game, they're learning more about the game. And then with their next character, when they're intermediate, they've got a campaign under their belt. They will be able to, to hone in on what they really want to do. Yeah, so Paladin, S tier. Pretty simple. Uh, Ranger. Ranger is going C. It's going C tier. I'll put it ahead of the monk. Because I'm going off of Tasha's cauldron of everything. With the the improved ranger uh, stuff that you can put in. And also, uh, it, it's not B. Like, rangers still... They're, they're good. But to make a ranger good, you have to know what you're doing, I think. I actually... Rangers probably low A to high B in a, in a like a veteran player tier list right now I think I would have to kind of go through and think about it some more but Ranger C because you don't have a lot of spell slots still which is a problem um, and yeah you just there are better options for players I don't think I need to spend a ton of time talking about the Ranger and its shortcomings and Things of that nature. We all know kind of what the ranger is in in general. I, It's kind of got to be tweaked. You got to help out. And if they don't know the intricacies, like I've seen so many young rangers just not take Hunter's Mark. They won't take Hunter's Mark because they, they don't understand. Like uh, that that's going to help you with damage. Like you, you need Hunter's Mark. It's really good. Um, favorite foe is helps them now with Tasha's, but still. Ranger just, it's complicated. You kind of have to build a, a campaign specifically around a Ranger player if you want them to get the most out of everything, because exploration is kind of, it's forgotten in D&D &D 5th edition. So, if, especially if you're running a, 
a written adventure, um, pre-written, you you have to do some work on the DM side for your new player. And again, that puts it in C tier for me. Next up is Rogue. And the Rogue is S for a new player. S. Because what, what does a Rogue do? Uh, they have expertise. They're good at a lot of things. The, the idea of a Rogue being this stealthy assassin. It's easy to understand. In combat, what do you have to do? You have to get your sneak attack. How do you get your sneak attack? You get advantage on an attack. Or you attack an enemy that's close to one of your allies. Easy. And you do a lot of damage. Rogues are great. Rogues, they they don't let you explore the magic side of the game necessarily, unless you're an arcane trickster, but they're just still good. They're really good. And the, the only thing that kind of holds rogues back is, of course, like the archetype of new players who try to run them and play them, where they try to play that edgy rogue. And... That's that's a pitfall of the class, but also, if you talk to a new player and it's going to be someone that you're going to be playing for for a while, you can help steer them in the right direction, maybe try to have them understand that they need to be helping the table. As long as your new player understands that, yeah, rogue's ass. You're, you're just doing so much good with a rogue, and you're asking so little of a player... That no matter how they build their rogue, they're going to be effective. Because sneak attack just scales itself. Even if normally you would have just awful damage, sneak attack comes in and it makes everything fine. So, next up, Sorcerer. I'm maybe controversial. I'm putting Sorcerer in A. And Sorcerer is in A because it makes a new player understand spellcasting because you have less spells which it, it, I know I kind of docked the bard and the ranger for having limited spells but the sorcerer it it's it's less number of spells are helped by you also having meta magic and with this you can help like understand your spells better you can understand tactical combat with spell casting um and uh, you your sorcerer can be good and be very effective even if you don't use meta magic even if you're just a, a new player and you're just using pure spell casting your sorcerer is still effective you just have less spells and maybe they can now understand oh i'll just burn my meta magics to get more spell slots and then as you go on in the campaign, they learn, wait, 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 I can use my meta magics to make these spells more effective. And I'll just use my sorcery points and, oh, no, th like this, this works. This, like I, you start adding on to everything and they start to realize, oh, I can start adding on. And you can swap out spells on a level up, like one spell, I believe. And so eventually they can start tweaking that character into something that is to their liking, to their style. And you learn spellcasting very effectively. And it also really helps with two other things. One, they have proficiency in constitution saving throws, so they're not dropping those concentration spells. And secondly, they're a charisma caster, so they can be the face of a party. And they can talk and do all that, and it's great. It's great. You, as a sorcerer, you can just be effective at what you do. Um, and that's all that you really want for a new player. Be effective at what you do. And make it easy. Make the make the fantasy easy to realize. And as a sorcerer, it's an easy to realize fantasy. And it's great. I highly recommend sorcerers for new players. And let's see. Next up, Warlock. If you want to cast spells, but also make it as easy as possible... Warlock. And here's the thing. I'm putting Warlock above Sorcerer for a few th reasons. One, they are spellcasters with not a lot of spells. So the player can grow to understand just a very few amount of spells. And they learn how to manage those resources. Secondly, they have their invocations, which helps them as well. It gives them a lot of 
flexibility. And third, I li the role plays better. I, I like the patron relationship that uh, a warlock gets, and a new player can really be drawn into the world and the lore with whatever patron that they choose. And it gives a lot of connection points for the DM to influence that character and to really get them into some role-playing moments, which is great. It's what we want. Uh, and if all goes wrong, Eldritch Blast. Just make sure that your warlock takes Eldritch Blast, explain to them, hey, this is a really good cantrip, it's going to get better over time, and this, this is good. And as long as your warlock takes that Eldritch Blast, they will always have something in their back pocket. They'll have their spells, they'll have their invocations. They are a charisma caster. Charisma I value highly for new players. Because talking, talking's good. Like, you don't need to learn any mechanics to talk. And so, if you can push new players into talking, into role-playing, and you have classes that back that up, A+, plus, good. Warlock does that. Probably one of one of the better classes to do that with. And you learn spellcasting, which is awesome. And they're super versatile. You want a melee warlock? I'll give you a hexblade. You want... Let's see. Uh, like a great old one is great for like that mind control weirdness. If you want just um, a damaging ranged caster, I believe it's Pact of the Fiend that's good with that. But, I mean, there's just a ton of great Warlock subclasses that you can get. And looking through the list of subclasses gets ideas for players about what they want their character to be. So, Warlock, solidly A. It's a bit below the fighter, because I hold the fighter in a really high regard with new players. Um, the fighter is just, again, it's super easy. It, and they know exactly what they're doing. Warlock, it takes a lot, a little bit more effort, but they learn pretty quickly and sorcerer just because it takes a bit more effort and they can i've seen players ignore the meta magic and sorcery points to a degree so that chips away at the sorcerer's viability but yeah i think all three of those are solid a now we come to the wizard wizard is bottom of c why is the wizard at the bottom of c because the wizard has so many spells the wizard doesn't have many hit points at all the wizard requires you to have a great understanding of D&D's mechanics. It's, it falls short in the same ways that the Druid does. It's super complicated. You have to know what you're doing. If you're out of position, you're going to go down. You're going to go unconscious. There's so many spells to learn. You, there's a gold requirement as well for wizards in order to copy spells into their spellbook. It's just rough. The only saving grace is that wizards have damaging spells like you have your fireball so eventually you're going to get to a spot where even if you're having a rough time with a wizard you still have damaging spells like you're still getting a few new spells and that's good you can do that um but new players they they go with a wizard they try to understand how the wizard works and it, it's rough for them it's just rough and I, that's, it's unfortunate, but yeah, it's, it's just tough for new players to play wizards. It's just really tough for them. And this comes to the last one. I'm going to put Matt Mercer's Blood Hunter in here. And maybe another controversial pick. I, I promise I love Critical Role. I love Matthew Mercer. But a Blood Hunter is top of D for new players why there's there's so many things you have to keep track of and it's a problem with the artificer as well is that I don't like any of the ways that's set up on a character sheet uh, the blood maledict feature I believe and all their blood curses uh, I see new players forgetting about them a lot they just don't use that ability in the moment and mostly because it, it hurts you. It hurts to use it. Um, the the Amplify ability is almost never used for those Blood Maledicts. Uh, your Crimson Right, it hurts you. Which, you know, if you're in a low health situation, hitting yourself with that Crimson Right 
sometimes isn't the best idea, and the Crimson Rite doesn't even do that much damage, and what if you're going against a creature that resists that Crimson Rite damage that you applied? And there's just so many things you have to worry about with a Blood Hunter. And for new players, it's difficult. And yeah, it's D. Uh, so, reaching the end of the video. And just going through, is there anything I want to change? I, I still... Do I want to flip Cleric and Sorcerer? Does that look right? No, no, I, I'm still going to keep it there. I I will put Wizard above Monk, though. Yeah, and I, th I think I'm good with that ranking. So essentially, if you have a new player, present them with a Rogue and Paladin first. And if they don't choose one of those, Fighter, Warlock, Sorcerer. And just kind of go down the list. I would almost say don't allow them to do a Blood Hunter, Druid, or Artificer if they really want to. Let them play it. But just be prepared for a class switch or to help them out. For Ranger, uh, Wizard, and Monk, be prepared to help them. Like, you, you will have to help that player with those three classes in order to make sure that they are having fun. That's the most important thing. Are they having fun? D and C tier, you're going to need to help to have fun. B, they will generally have fun. Like, there are some pitfalls, but they'll have fun. Um, you, they'll, there's a learning curve to Cleric, Barbarian, and Bard, but not too much. They'll probably be fine. A is, you'll, you'll be having fun. Like, I, I think those are very fun for new players, and they're strong. They can be strong. And S tier is... Players will have a lot of fun, and they are very strong. Where a new player and a veteran player are going to be on about the same level. Like a, a veteran player will obviously be getting more for their character in situations where they've specifically built a character to be good. That veteran player will outshine the inexperienced player. But in most cases, they'll be on the same level. Wow, this is a, a longer video, and I've talked for a long time. Uh, if you made it this far, thank you so much. I, I hope to get another video out soon based on this tier list, but for veteran players and what veteran players uh, should do with class choice and how I see the classes through a veteran's player's eyes. Because, spoiler alert, the druid goes up here. Like, the, the druid is... I'll I'll get more into why I love a druid so much uh, later, but yeah, uh, thank you all. Uh, subscribe, perhaps. I'm a small channel, and I'm trying to grow, and every subscription, and every view, every like helps. And also, thank all of you for entering the dungeon.